So modern cameras like what I have in front of me, the R3 and the Z9 are really good. You can probably even shoot these cameras without, you know, choosing any autofocus point or even closing your eyes. As long as the subject is something that is recognizable by these cameras, you probably won't have an issue getting sharp photos. How is it done? And today's video, for the first one in my tech for photography, we'll look at subject detection, autofocus. How does it work? Why doesn't it work for older cameras? And sometimes, why does it detect weird things or maybe doesn't work at all? And why is that box that is no highlighting the subject a little laggy? And in today's video, we will talk about it. I'm Richard and today we'll talk about subject detection autofocus. Now, I have to say one thing before we start. Uh, whatever you see in this video today is really based on my research and what I think the camera manufacturers are doing itself. I'm not 100% sure and that's because nobody reveals how they actually accomplish it. But without wasting time, let's talk about the technology behind this. Now, subject detection autofocus is very common in all the camera manufacturers today. You can take a look at a lot of their promo videos. They do show you how it works. But by and large, what is subject detection autofocus? Now, subject detection autofocus is not new. It is something already used in the industry and that is called object detection. And it is some form of a computer vision technique that allows us to identify and locate subjects in the scene. Now, of course, this uh, form of artificial intelligence requires a certain amount of uh, training and various, uh, I'll say, processing power to get it done. So in today's video, I'll talk about, you know, how is it done and how is a camera doing it and as such, answer some of the questions that I highlighted just now. So you can say that uh, to really start doing this whole object detection, first, you need to have a library of images, as large as possible, as many as possible. Once you have all these library of images, you know, you get uh, somebody to label them, technically to draw boxes and then telling the machine that this is a human or this is a bird or this is a train or this is a car. Then you do, you know, the initial labeling. Once you're done with the labeling, you put them through a training and what you do is that you shove all this information into a machine with some sort of algorithm and requiring some time, and you'll get something called a model. This is actually part of a training, and uh, this form of uh, training and you know getting the information is part of this neural network type of artificial intelligence. And you'll get something called a model, which allows us to detect images and do exactly that, highlighting those subjects out nicely. Now, I'm obviously simplifying a lot of things. There is a lot more depth to this on how the algorithm works, what are the different way of training, the different type of networks available for the artificial intelligence and what's not. And let's not forget, when I say large amount of images, I mean hundreds of thousands at times. I'm not sure how much or how many images that the camera manufacturers use to train or who do they contracted to train this, this uh, artificial intelligence itself. But by and large, I believe that it is done relatively well in these kind of model cameras. And now, with the model trained with all the images, what happens is that you put this model inside your camera itself in some sort of a storage in the memory. And this acts as a way to tell the processor what to detect and you know, how to detect them. So when you see a new image, you know, or let's say you take a photo or maybe you're running on live view, so the images are streamed in through the sensor onto the processor. What happens is that the processor using the model that is built into the system will try to detect the human and give you an outcome. Now you notice that I wrote there 90% because you know, these kind of networks normally don't give you like black or white, one or zero type of output. They give you some sort of a number or confidence level. And in this case, the confidence can be about 90%. And you know, there is a threshold that manufacturers have to set so that they agree that this is something that they should show and of course identify to the user. As such, they will highlight it up and then the autofocus mechanism will kick in to focus on whatever's in the box. So the thing is, why does the detection sometimes not work? And why does it not work on older cameras? Why can't we just upgrade the older cameras and make them do subject detection like modern ones? If you notice, I think like Nikon and Canon in their early days tried to patch their cameras up, but they don't get very good. Only till like Z9 and the R3 and R5, they jumped drastically. And that's because processing it is quite 
a pain in the ass if you ask me. It requires a lot of processing power to actually you know, detect something. And in fact, if you go online and search for object detection type of algorithms and models, it will take significant amount of time to get certain boundings and subject detection going. The thing is, you know, subject detection ultimately is uh, some sort of a model that comes out with this confidence number. And uh, there are different algorithms of doing it. And it's always, uh, you know, combination of time versus accuracy. The more time you give it, the more accurate it becomes for a lot of the algorithms and models out there. Now, uh, obviously, uh, for a camera, you know, there is limited time because uh, if you wait too long, the, the data is no longer valid. You can't autofocus properly. And if it's too inaccurate, users will not use it. And if you notice, the earlier days type of uh, subject detection or face detection is exactly that. It is not very accurate, it is not very fast, it's laggy and quite unusable if you ask me. So the thing is, this time and accuracy is a combination of various things, but on general it is, you know, the restriction of processing power and algorithm. So if you have better algorithm, you have usually either better time or better accuracy. And if you have more processing power, you can always reduce the time. As such, use algorithms that are more accurate. Obviously, we can't control all them. Uh, algorithms are things that researchers do day in, day out to get it better. But what we can do is increase the processing power in our cameras. And how is it done today, I believe, is that a normal processor like this in your camera is a generic processor. It processes images and various things, but it is not the best way to process stuff. So what happened is, I believe, I think, I'm not 100% sure, newer sensors are built in with something called a neural processing unit. You can go online and search. Your phone may have them. So Samsung phones call them NPUs and Apple calls them neural engines, I believe. Apple neural engines or something along the line. Let me show you the image here. So every manufacturer in the handphone space is using some sort of NPU to actually power their systems so that their handphones are fast. I believe that that is the same for you know, the processors on our cameras today. They have probably some sort of NPUs built into there so that they can firstly uh, process, of course, the model, the artificial intelligence more efficiently. And secondly, they can be done without bogging down the processor, which also has to do things like autofocus, image processing, and you know, ultimately converting the RAW to JPEGs and what's not. There's so many things that have to be done in the camera that probably it is better to hand off this whole detection to something else. And this is really the reason why uh, probably older cameras can never patch and perform the same as newer cameras. They just probably don't have the processing power or they are using old algorithms and they cannot run newer algorithms out here. So the next thing is, why does it not detect at times, you know? Why does it sometimes not detect the face? Why does it not work in low light? Why does it not work in brighter lights? And that's because, you know, look at our training set. So in this particular example here, I use four images that are well littered and we, you know, highlight it out. Now, as I said, uh, the system actually does a confidence type of uh, estimation to get you the bounding box and then the manufacturer agrees with it that this is the level or threshold that they will show and work on it. And in this case, if you underexpose an image, the image don't look anything like those that you trained earlier. Now, of course, in real world, uh, the training will be done in many ways. There are permutations, rotations, exposing, underexposing, and various ways to process your image so that you get variants to train on. But for just this example, uh, what happened is that the model itself and the processor will output something. It's just that this something is probably not good enough of a threshold that manufacturers will feel confident to show to the users and then use it for autofocus purpose. And if the manufacturer is too, I'll say, loose on the threshold, what you get is a lot of false detection, weird bounding boxes that don't focus on what you want. Now, the other thing is, what if there's an occlusion? Why does it not work? Now, the thing is that in real world, when you train images or when people who build such engine train images, they normally include images that are slightly occluded so that the artificial intelligence can understand what is occlusion to a certain extent. However, if the occlusion is too big, covers too much of the subject, or the subject doesn't look anything like uh, what is trained so far, it will cause a little bit of confusion. And in this case, it is possible that a human with an occlusion in the center results in breaking the two pieces. And the system will say there's the head that is 55%, the body that is 40%. But maybe the camera manufacturer threshold is 75. 
and as such, both is rejected and no detection is done. Well, it is definitely better than showing both of them on the screen and confuse your uh, uh, autofocus itself. Now, there's also the part where what if you use an image that looks nothing like what you trained before? In the early days of subject detection, you will notice that it doesn't work for many things. Sometimes it doesn't work on certain skin color, sometimes it doesn't work on certain clothing, sometimes it doesn't work on certain costumes, cosplays, or dressed up. You know, so many things it doesn't work on. And that's because of the training set and, uh, of course, the various tweaking in the engine itself. So in this case, you know, remember all our training was just normal costumes or normal clothes. You know, now suddenly you throw in a cosplay photo, the system just don't understand, and we'll say that this is probably 60% chance of being human. And it is lower than the camera threshold of 75, for example, and it rejects it. And lastly, sometimes you get weird bounding boxes, like bounding boxes on the chest, or it detects the eye on the mouth, or it detects like there is this weird thing behind that has some sort of human shape and it thinks that it's a human. And that's because uh, the system is still trying to, I would say, as guess where the subject is and try to bound it up. And as such, sometimes it can do false positives. And in this case, there is a chance of having a false positive where it, detects, it thinks that the human is just the body and the legs, not including the head itself. And it is past the threshold of 75%. As such, the camera do detect weird stuff. Pretty much, this is all the reason why it's possible that you know the subject detection algorithm get thrown off and don't work. Obviously, I'm just using human examples, but you can pretty much replicate it for birds, for cars, for anything out there. Subject detection is not a foolproof kind of a, uh, I'll say as a detection method. It is a form of training and a lot of you know uh, I'll say as a optimization in the algorithm itself and you know it is never perfect however it can get better with better training sets better algorithm and of course more processing power to just deal with it now the last one is sometimes you know we notice that the box on the you no know, tracking is slow and what do i mean by that let's take a look at one of the promotion videos by canon and canon actually uses the real autofocus that is coming out of the camera to display as a promotion material and you can see the box is just slightly lagging behind the person just slightly now in the older days, if you have used the older Nikons, Canons, or even Fujifilm cameras, you'll notice that the box is really far away. And it's not until like the A9 that the box was consistently on the face itself. So what is happening? So let me explain to you the possibility or what I think is happening itself. Now the sensor reads out the image and then goes to the processor. It takes a little bit of time and it comes out with an output, which ultimately gets pushed to the viewfinder. Now in a world where you have infinite processing power and no latency, this is probably the best and you have a box that's solid on the subject itself. Now obviously we can't do that in real world and that's because it takes time to process and we don't want that latency because the latency is problematic. And in this case, the processing time may cost you two frames and you don't want it to lag by two frames. Why don't you want it to lag by two frames? It's simple. Imagine opening your eyes, one eye looking into the viewfinder and the other eye looking into the real world. What you will see is that the real world is ahead of what you see in the viewfinder. That's obviously not very optimal. You know, you don't want to shoot something that's happening behind. Or should I say, when you press the shutter, you're not going to capture what you are seeing in the viewfinder, which is very distracting. And in fact, some of the cameras today still have a viewfinder that is a little bit slow and laggy. And this is really one of the reasons, because processing takes time, but then reach the viewfinder, it is slow. Now, obviously, uh, manufacturers don't want that. And I'm guessing this is how they actually accomplish it. What they do is that they take the image, push in the processor. While it is pushing to the, you know, the neural processing unit or whatever that is processing the uh, subject detection, object detection, what it does is that take the same frame and push it to the viewfinder first. What you have now is a viewfinder with an image that is up to date. And then the neural processing engine or whatever that is processing the model will take their time to actually get the bounding box up. Now, as the scene moves forward, it goes into like frame 2 and frame 3. The scene has moved forward to frame 3. Obviously, uh, what it's showing now is current. What it's showing in the viewfinder is also current because it's trying to go as low latency as possible. But the bounding box is behind time. The output from the uh, model itself, from the subject detection uh, algorithm, 
is slightly behind the real world. As such, what you have is when you try to overlay the bounding box on the real world, it is like two frames ago. Now, this is actually very common because in the day, uh, nothing is free. All this processing that is required to do the subject detection or object detection requires quite a little bit of processing power and it is quite a marvel that they manage to squeeze it into a camera like this and still run it relatively real time. I would say that in years to come, this problem will go away. We will reach a point of time where our models are very confident very fast and we have newer engines or newer processing units and there will come a time where we have perfect autofocus systems that literally can look at the subject, track them around, they can jump, run and hide but the system will still capture them in focus. And really that's about it. This is my short explanation on subject detection on how I think it works and uh, no, this is something that I've been doing for the past few years. Uh, I do a little bit on this artificial intelligence stuff so I understand how object detection actually works. And when it came to the camera systems, I was really excited. But the thing is that it's really hard to explain to people why it doesn't work at times or, or why certain manufacturers are so laggy. It's really because of all these things that I've explained just now that really results in what you see in cameras today. But as I said, this is the outcome of algorithms. This is the outcome of training. And this is also the outcome of processing. We can always get better. Algorithms are getting better. Processors are getting better. And <laughs> the world images are growing exponentially. We will definitely have more and more, uh, I would say, as possible samples to try and train the system on. I will say that uh, in the near future, give you another maybe three to five years, you will have perfect autofocus system that probably has very little errors, can pinpoint almost anything at lightning speed. That is probably what will happen in the near future. Camera processing power has been increasing about two times every three to four years. Uh, whenever a chip upgrades, they always say that this chip is two times or three times more powerful than the previous one. Uh, there are, of course, many ways to compute power, but let's take it literally. Uh, that is what's happening. So every two to three years, you can expect double of processing power and it does mean almost half the processing time for things like artificial intelligence. And that's about it for today. I hope you enjoyed this short little video. This is my first tech for photography and I hope you learned something out of it. Bye-bye.